John 3, 16 and 17. Again, want to welcome everybody joining us online. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. Hallelujah. Familiar portion of scripture to launch off into. But hopefully I'll be able to quicken something in your heart and your mind to help you draw closer to not only the Lord, but closer to being like him. How many wants to be more like him? Hallelujah. How many thinks you already are? Let's work on that. <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, everybody say should, should not perish, but have everlasting life. That should is not an is. Qualified in verse 17, for God sent not a son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Wow. Lord, we're so thankful for your love. We're thankful for the the season. We're thankful that here in America we can celebrate Christmas still. Pray God that your hand would be upon this service, upon this message tonight, that it would quicken, that it would stir, that it would be planted in the fertile soil of our souls. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Acts 20 and 35 says, I have showed you all things how that so laboring you ought to support the weak <laughs> and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. We struggle there. Everybody likes receiving and we like keeping. But giving stretches us. <laughs> For innocent children, Christmas is amazing. It is one of the highlights of the year. Reflecting on my own enjoyment, Christmas was just wonderful. The food, the family, the get-togethers gifts. Gifts are awesome. <laughs> gifts are awesome. Are you hearing me? Children become excited. And when children get excited, it kind of spreads. I like giving gifts to kids. There's nothing like the dancing eyes of a delighted child who's handed a gift. <laughs> The Bible gives us insight how we are to be in the kingdom of God. Mark said, it says in Mark 10, 15, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall not enter therein. Maybe we need to take a look at our children a little deeper. I'm not talking about the immaturity side. Us guys struggle with that naturally. But to look at them on the innocent side. Pretty important when the Lord makes a statement. Truly I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter in. I'm reminded of a verse of scripture in Psalms 119 and 165. And I'd like you to turn there if you have your Bible. And I want you to remember this verse. It is applicable today. Great peace have they which love thy law. And nothing shall offend them. When you know the Bible. When you know Scripture, when you get to know Jesus, 
nothing will offend you. Been offended lately? Got an offense you've been harboring? <laughs> I'm sorry. I wilted your Fruit Loops. Because everybody, honest, man, I, I, I kind of got a couple old ones I made hanging on to. Can I get an honest amen? Some of us have been stalemated not only in our ministries, but in our homes, in our lives, in our walk with God, because we think we know better than him, and we think it's okay to hold a grudge. But Christmas is forgiving. Uh, it's a play on words tonight. So living up to that concept that Jesus emphatically impressed upon us, except ye, hello? There's something about you, you got to walk around with innocence. Not holding grudges, not walking around angry with an attitude. Not, not, not thinking, well, blessed, not being stingy. Living up to that is quite difficult as we age because we allow things to build up. We're quick to talk about the historical things in our lives that we remember where someone did us wrong. We have a great trail. We've marked it well of things in our history that, well, if you'd have been here, if you'd have seen, if you'd have heard, if you'd have known. And so things go unforgiven. But thankfully, not at your birthday, not at my birthday, but at the celebration of Christ's birthday, we are reminded every year that Christmas is forgiving. <laughs> A child's innocence is blind to the sticky situations and the awkward moments that adults face because of the years of history that sometimes show up during the holidays. For many adults, it becomes very difficult due to life's baggage. It's easy to hear a lot of people just talk about surviving the holidays. When your past life or the, even the past year, especially this ridiculous year. Can I get it? Amen. Maybe you faced death. I have. It's been a rough year for me when it comes to that. Maybe divorce. Maybe division. Struggles financially. COVID-19 rules and restrictions in some places. You can't celebrate Thanksgiving. You can't celebrate Christmas. Yet they, those guys saying that still do. It's kind of funny. There's a crazy factor in our lives. Because every family has one. Raise, raise, raise your hand if you know you, you got a crazy person in your family. If you didn't raise your hand, you now know. <laughs> you, you are. One of our characters in the Bible that we read about, Old Testament Joseph, he, he had some family pain. When he was young, his brothers grabbed him, threw him in a pit, and sold him. <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's going to be a little baggage if you get handled like that a little bit. Some of you are sitting around have a hard time getting along at Christmas just because someone said something. When was the last time you got thrown in a pit and sold by your family? <laughs> now, forgive me, but my government may be doing that to us, but family members generally don't. <laughs> That's free. I'm getting in trouble. It's, it, when he was young, his brother sold him to get rid of him. And I'm sure they're 
could have been a lot of baggage. She could have carried for a lot of years about something like that. And so when we finally get into the latter stages of, 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 of the story of Joseph, and when Joseph is coming face to face with those that betrayed him and sent him on a downward spiral of struggle. There were a few highs, but every time he turned around, he pits and prisons and Potiphar's wives and problems and issues. And all he did was have a dream. Well, a couple of dreams. Genesis 45 verses 1 and 2 says, Then when Joseph... You look, because all of a sudden at this, this pinnacle time in his, in his career and in his life, he looks and he sees his brothers. Isn't it funny how we vividly remember those who hurt us? We imprint that over and over again. Obviously carried some baggage because the Bible says he could not refrain himself before all of them that stood by him and he cried. And like most guys, he told everyone to go out from him. Men, men, men don't want to be seen crying. They, we, we, they think it's weakness. And he caused everyone to go out from him, and there stood no man with him. While Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. The Bible says, if you read it, and he wept aloud. I, I, I can't imagine the intricacies and the emotions and the feelings. And, and, and coupled with, as a child, what he had for dreams. Crushed by the very ones he's come face to face with. <laughs> the Bible says he wept so loud that it says, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. <laughs> kind of jumps off the page and brings it close to home when looked at in the vivid transparency of a real individual. And you start thinking about your own life and you lay this over it and you get some of the texture of whew, kind of when they walk in your house Christmas to eat at your table or your mind, your heart yet despite all the years and all the other trials it all came rushing back to Joseph. It takes courage to deal with our relationship issues face to face. <laughs> and I'm sure if we're honest, even you tough guys, we'd all weep just like Joseph, truth be told. Sadly, it's easy to slip into a cycle of continuing the hurt and recycling the pain. Never making it right or never letting Christmas be about forgiving. The only way to really stop this merry-go-round of family pain and struggles and issues and, and complexities between one is forgiveness. Christmas is so much more than gifts and spending money. And, and please don't go in debt for it. If someone doesn't love you enough, for you to look at him and say, you know what? I got something a little more economical this year. And a hug and a handshake and a card would be enough. Because the intimacy and the reality and the truthfulness is far more than something that will get put on the shelf. Are you hearing me? Christmas is forgiving. Luke chapter 6, verses 27 and 28 says, But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you, which hate you. Bless them that curse you. And pray for them which 
despitefully use you. Well, pastor, how do you forgive when you can't control your feelings? <laughs> I got a really complicated answer for you. I'm going to get really psychological here, and I'm going to pull from some of the greatest teaching of all time. You make a choice to forgive. <laughs> you ever grab the hot pan? You know, there are some times that I wonder, you got the, the plastic handle pans that you that are screwed into the to the pan and they always come loose. Why do they make stuff so cheap? And then you get the metal ones that it's metal all the way through, and you grab that bad boy when it's a million degrees, and you leave a permanent imprint in the palm of your hand, because, uh, and you're like, why do they make them out of metal? <laughs> but what do you do when you got a hold of that pan? You let it go. That's complicated. That took a PhD. Man, pastor is smart. Because standing there, you hurt me. And holding that item, getting even more upset that it not only hurts you, but it continues to hurt you, is a little crazy. What do you do? just a pan. The Bible lets us know, Jesus lets us know that offenses are going to come. It's not if, it's when. Let go of the animosity. Let go of your questioning of why weren't they perfect. Or give. One of the things you need to do, and we have to do this daily. No, I'm not going to run. I'm not going to jump and shout. It's not Sunday. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to break a sweat. I'm going to wear this shirt again. Let me tell you how to handle offenses. It's real simple. How much has Christ forgiven you? Then compare his list to yours. And do me a Santa favor. Check it twice. You got ought, you got offense. And you feel justified? Look again. Because Christmas is forgiving. Do you have a list of fences? Why don't you list yours and lay them side by side? And then you'll let go of the offense of somebody else, just like Jesus let go of yours. Ephesians chapter 4, I'm going to read a number of verses here. I need you to hear me. If you want to follow along in your Bible, which is your textbook tonight, you can. Listen to me now. Paul speaking, laying some clarity here. Let me help you. He's saying, hey, Ephesians, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But, 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 no. That's wise old sage rabbit, Thumper's mama. If you can't say nothing nice, don't say nothing at all. 
you know, I, it's, I'm pastor, so I can say it like this. Some of you, I want revival in my home. I want to see God move in my home. You can't come in here and go to church and go home and eat crow all the way home and think you're going to have revival when you're crucified and ate the pastor. Go home and have turkey. Go home and have ham. But don't eat crow. <laughs> Not very often I put a humorous sermon together, but Christmas is forgiving. What does the word corrupt mean there? Translated, it means hurtful. You've got someone around you that just wants to say something hurtful about somebody. They're not Christ-like. Because Christ and Christmas is forgiving. If someone has ought and they're sowing division, don't you coddle them. God's trying to reach them. Because Christmas is forgiving. <laughs> it is corrupt, it's hurtful, evil in effect or influence. Can you imagine somebody calling themselves a Christian? wanting to, in an evil manner, influence your feelings about another human who God absolutely loves. I don't want to talk bad about no one. Don't put me in a corner. Don't, don't do that to me because Christ, Christmas, is forgiving Great peace have they that love thy law. You love his word so much. You can't get offended at someone because you're so Christ-like. God hates division. He hates discord. You can find that. If you're so in discord in the church, if you're so in discord in your home, God hates that. Don't coddle a person that's doing that. Give them Christ. Give them the word. Don't coddle people with illicit, ill feelings. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Is that important? Well, let me tell you what it does. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. want to make God grieve? You have animosity towards someone? That will grieve the spirit of God. For God so loved the world. He's not talking about the big dirt ball mound that's circling and spinning in space. He's talking about people. And if he can do that for people that will, and I could go through the crucifixion, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to do that. Ask yourself, what kind of person is going to sit there and tear another person down whom God so loved? Christmas is forgiving. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. This is a character study. This is a mirror to look into and go, wow, do I find me in here? And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. I tell you, Christmas is forgiving. Colossians goes on, and it says in chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. What's he saying? 
forgive. I know you got a quarrel. Can you imagine if God held his quarrel against you? So also do you. And above all, let me say above all, these things, put on charity, put on some love. Put it on. Well, you're putting me on. Yeah. I'm putting you on, Jesus, which is the bond of perfectness. You know, let me, let me help you real quick. There's different kind of people when it comes to church. How many knows the parable of the lost coin? It's right in line with the parable of the lost sheep and right in line with the parable of the lost boy. That's a picture of the church. A lot of people judge the church and say, judge pastors, well, they should do this. Let me explain something. There's something about you when you're struggling here in the church. We're going to sweep and find that coin. We're going to find you. We're going to be here for you. We're going to come out and find you. You're angry or upset. You're going, we're going to be here. That, that's a picture of the church. We're going to love one another in here. Then you get the lost sheep who's kind of just messed up and don't know any better. They get lost. You go and you go find them. You call them. You go call them. Hey, what's going on? And then there are those like the prodigal when they get a bad attitude. They don't like the father's house. They don't, and they leave. The first two you look out and help for, but that last one got to make their way back. They got to find out, wait a minute. You kind of mess some things up in your head. You've lost the love for the Father. You don't have his word. You've got ought in your heart. You've got, you got to find that place. And when you come walking back in here, I was wrong. Not the church, not the pastor, not how things are run. Oh, you, you, better, you better know this word if you're going to jump up and down and have an attitude because Christmas is forgiving. So when you look at the other side. Well, what's on the other side of forgiving for you and I? Why should you forgive? What's in it for you? Well, what was on the other side of forgiveness for Joseph? Genesis 45, verses 7 through 8 say, And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth. And to save your lives by a great deliverance. Careful of that person that you're mistreating. They may be the very one that's standing in the gap for you. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. Now that right there is a mouthful. That's saying I'm going to live for God no matter what I go through, even if God allows something to happen to me. Those people that get sideways, that get upset, and they're unconsolable. They're of their father, the devil. Just hear what I'm saying. When you get to that place, that great peace have they. Joseph was so in love and so believed his creator that when all this came about, he was able to handle the baggage, open it up, empty it out, and understand now. How can I have odd? God used me to show forgiveness, to save. Mm. Listen, so now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Let me ask this question of you. Trust you with pain? Can God send you ahead? Can God allow someone to treat you wrong and you're going to maintain your Christianity? Can God wound you and you still worship? Can you bleed a little bit for your brother and your sister? Or will you 
take offense. Genesis 50, 19 and 21, And Joseph said unto them, Fear not. What an understanding we have. For am I in the place of God? But as for you, you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Now, therefore, fear not. I will nourish you. Wait a minute. Right there, most of us don't want a pound of flesh. I want them to come back and I want them to apologize. I want them to do this. I want them, they need, they need to make this right. They, You amen that other stuff. What you, 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 is your amen got lost now? When it comes to actually being Christ-like, where's your amen? Where's your amen when it comes to giving? And your little ones. And he comforted them. All this back. He had a wagon load. He, he had to have a truckload instantly. He's saying, God has blessed me. And even to those that despitefully used him, even those that did, e those that did evil unto him, even those that hurt him, let me give. The Bible says, and he comforted them and spake kindly to them. Hmm. Can I say this? You got dreams in the kingdom of God? If they're for your only, those aren't dreams. Those are probably nightmares. But when you have a dream that God, whatever you got to do, wherever I got to go, whatever I got to say, whatever I got to face and go through, Joseph's dreams were really not just for Joseph. The very people that got offended benefited from the fact that he had a dream that they used to send him in the trial of his life. Oh, and when it all came down, instead of baggage of wanting vengeance and baggage of being able to tell the story and recite every detail, he said, let me nourish you. Let me give you, even let me bless your children. Let oh. Christmas is forgiving. The bitterness stopped with Joseph. <sighs> Dealing with unforgiveness is your first priority. When you want to live for God, when you turn and give your life for God, the very first thing you have to deal with is what? Repenting. God, forgive me. And when you get right with God, what's the, your first order? Oh, thank you, Sister Verdell. How's that working for you? Or have you been in church long enough to where now you think you're, all, you're, you're on par with God and you can sit back and analyze where and who and what you forgive and what you won't? How many's glad God didn't beat you up like that? How many's glad when, when, when you repented the, the, the preacher buried you in a watery grave and you come out baptized in Jesus name you got to receive the Holy Ghost because God didn't hold a grudge he said let me nourish you let me bless you let me help you let me be there for you because Christ and Christmas is forgiving it's urgent that we are quick to forgive because if you drag it out you may deceive yourself and not even realize that bitterness and unforgiveness. You could turn around and hate people, hate the church. Be careful. Let me help you. Don't even foster a spouse that lets corrupt communication come out. You better be a Christ and, oh, be loving. God's forgiven us. You got to learn to teach this. How good is it that you get up and preach this and then you let one of your own family members sit there in the gall of bitterness utter things that, that are caustic. How can you 
accept such a great forgiveness from God then turn around and be unforgiving. Maybe we need to check the list twice. Maybe. Maybe you need to give yourself something for Christmas this year. The person some of you need to forgive is yourself. <laughs> There's an interesting unfolding of events in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 19. It says, but when David saw that his servants whispered, he'd sinned, he'd fallen and messed up. Had an illegitimate child, basically committed murder. David perceived that the child was dead. He realized, okay. Therefore, David said unto his servants, is the child dead? And they say, yeah, he's dead. <clears throat> then David arose from the earth, washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel. And came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Look what he did. Came to the house of the Lord and worshiped. You have, let me tell you something. If you're not going to get honest and emotional with God, you're probably not going to get anything. It's those that hunger that get filled. You, you, David, with all this going on, I got to get in the house. I, I'm going to worship God. There, are, I, I don't understand people that because you've been around in a while, you don't think, man, there, there, there ought to be a greater degree of worship. There's a there's such an appreciation every day, every old, I just I'm every every holiday, every year that rolls by, every day. Oh, God, I want to worship you and thank you. All these years, all this time. How many, anybody ever been lost in your old thoughts and you wake up and you realize, I've been stewing on this all day long. And you realize, what? Negative, what? Oh. And sadly, some people do it for years and they walk into church and they sit down and they actually have the mentality, God ought to be glad I'm just here. Be careful who you sit by in church. Sit me by someone that's going to worship and praise. I don't want to sit by someone that's sitting there stoic and staring. Give me by someone that's still thankful for forgiveness, that still has a fresh understanding. Yeah, my original place of meeting with God was years ago, but that mercy and that grace and that forgiveness is fresh today. I'm going to worship him like, hey, he did it again for me today. Look what he's done for me. He changed his apparel and came in the house when he worshiped. Then he came to his own house. When he required, they set bread before him and he ate. He did eat. Then said his servants unto him, what, what thing is it that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead, wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. What did David do? He came face to face with the fact that the situation could not be changed. He accepted that. He gave his feelings to God. He focused on what was left and not what was lost. That concept right there saved my sisters and I. There was a moment in our lives where we had a bitter situation happen. And I'll never forget as being the only boy in the house with my dad watching you know with my schoolyard mentality that if you get hit hit back harder and I remember 
the innocence of a child making the statement and my mom pulling me up short. If your dad did that, then all of you'd lose him. He was able to accept the loss because it was out of his hands and he lived to say what he had left. David realized he, and he focused on what was left and not what was lost and he asked God for forgiveness and he moved on. Not in a callous manner, not in a, but in a reverent, the Lord gives and the Lord takes it away. Can we get to the place where we can give? Give God the credit that he knows more than us. Give God the honor of worshiping and praising him and being demonstrative and I'm going to worship you, that I'm going to praise you. It was after much prayer and tears. It was a great loss. It was David's great failure. But to have remained stuck there would have caused it even more harm. Listen, Isaiah 6 and 1 says, And in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. In the midst where his world fell apart, he saw the Lord. In the midst of the struggle, in the midst of everything going wrong, in the midst of the very one he looked up to, everything that he relied upon, finally when that got removed, he saw the Lord. There's been a tremendous year of pain this year. Some of you have faced some financial struggles, health struggles. But the Lord's brought us through. Here we are. see God in it? Hallelujah. I'm still here. Can we stand? Can we say hallelujah? Can you look around and go, I made it another year. I'm still here. I didn't get offended. I did not. Man, I could be lost. I'd be getting caught up in the world. I could get a messed up mind and a dark and bitter heart and be gone. But I made it. I'm still here. Christ in Christmas is forgiving. Forgiving. Like Old Testament Joseph. Oh, it's been a rough wild, crazy ride. But I can see God's hand in it. I can still see God's hand in it. Like David, he blew it. He messed up. But he can still trust God in it. What did Job teach us? <laughs> when others give up, he said, no, I'm going to retain my integrity. That's, that's what his wife was asking him. You're going to retain your integrity in the middle of all this? Yeah. Oh, I, I thought I've learned something about the God that I serve. You know, I got to thinking about that today. When you read about Job, that he went and did sacrifices for his children in case they did anything. The kids didn't do anything, but the devil did. Was Job's life and his example of being overly giving and godly, do you think he really regretted it after what happened? Glad I was a dad that even gave to the degree for my own children's sake. Oh, what a, what a giving, sacrificial giving 
amazingly minded man that didn't even realize what foresight that was to be so generous to God because he realized he could have saved it for his kids, but he was smart enough to give it to their saved. Oh, God, tell me all, that might be too much for you. You can't spend your life li looking in the rearview mirror. Give God your today. Give God your grief. Give him your sorrow. Stop living in the past of the would have, should have, could have. Give yourself a gift this Christmas. God forgive me. God forgive me. Christmas is forgiven, folks. Philippians 3, 13. Brethren, all you stoic people, we kind of put it on air like we've got it all together, but I don't have it all together. I count not myself to apprehend it, to have apprehended. Let me let you off the hook. Brother Lawrence, I'm going to let you off the hook. Brother, Brother Lee, Brother Bruce, Brother Davenport, Brother Lulu, Brother Crow, Brother Jake, Brother Zeke. Let me let you off the hook. One of the worst places you can do is walk in here and want, people, and want people to think you got it all figured out. I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. You know that the story of David's failure is fall. The story of God rebuilding his life is a big part of the Christmas story. What did that story have to do with Christmas? Matthew chapter 1 and verse 6, it says, And Jesse begat David the king. And David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. Oh God, do you realize what God gave him? <laughs> Survive. A second chance. Forgiveness. And she shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this, listen to this, now all this was done. Everybody say, now all this was done. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. I like that part. All this was done. David, God gave you, he forgave you. Why? Christmas is forgiven. <laughs> Christmas is forgiving. David. How amazing is it that God took a situation that needed an amazing moment of forgiveness and put it in line the Christ child. Let's talk to the Lord right now. Christ, Christmas is forgiving. 